My name is Arash Azizi. I'm a PhD candidate at New York University, and I wrote this book called Shadow Commander, Soleimani, the US and Iran's Global Ambitions, my first book. Um, how I got interested in it, so my scholarly research and my, if you were, social political interest for a long time has been about what can be very broadly called Iran's ties to the Arab world, well, Iran's ties to the world as a whole, but especially to the Arab world. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it actually starts from a question, uh, frankly, that, you know, why is it that um, so many of our Iranian connections are, um, are to, the, to the world, are, you know, usually to the West or to even Latin America, but actually fewer to our immediate surroundings, the Arab world and Turkey. So it sort of, it, it started from that. And then, so I do look at, well, the connections that are there. And the story of Qasem Soleimani and what the Islamic Republic has been doing in the Arab world, in the world as a whole, but especially in the Arab world, has always long been sort of one of my interests. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, last year a publisher showed interest into in the story of Soleimani and asked me about it. And uh, of course, after he was killed in, in January, um, it became more topical. So I used my research, both uh, scholarly research, but also research that I had done as a journalist in the years prior um, when I covered Iran's relation with Iraq and Iran's presence in the region as a whole. And uh, I turned into a book. <laughs> well done. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because you were already thinking about a kind of book. You were looking at um, the Arab world and Iran's uh, entanglements in the Arab world. And I know that's something that you do cover in the book itself. Did his assassination sort of um, encourage you to, to, to actually focus on him as, as a central figure in that, in that story? Actually, no. So, you know, already by about May 2019, so six months before its publication, I had almost committed to writing this book. But it was seen as a more long-term project, like the publisher was right. interested you know, in the figure of Soleimani and how to use him to explain Iran's role in mm -hmm. the region. But with the assassination, just you know, basically came the book deal. I mean, yeah. um, you know, it was a more long-term thing before. But when the assassination happened, the publisher told me that you know, if, if you know, the time is now, um, mm. you know, if you, and and also if you write about a life, obviously, um, after that life has finished, it gives you a a, a more end marked right. Um, period yes, to work on so it became really it became the book is primarily uh, I mean I, I'd like to see the book primarily as the story of Iran's uh, foreign operations and foreign policy yeah. as yeah. told through the story of the life of uh, one man but it's not a straight out biography in this way you know it is about him and he's the hook but it's really about the Islamic Republic's um, what I call global ambitions. No that's very interesting and I think that's one of the reasons why this book is, a, is an important one because it's told from the perspective of Iran rather than the perspective of uh, the West. So I think that's, that's going to be very interesting. Um, do you think it will be translated into other languages? Um, well, we've had some initial interest uh, from uh, Arabic, definitely, um, and Polish, uh, Hebrew. Ah, okay. um, yeah, so, so we've had some interest, but you know, it's a long walk to translate. I also have, a, there's of course a lot of interest in Persian, to translate the Persian. I feel a bit uh, weird about this. I'm a translator myself. I've, you know, published, right. you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe like a dozen books of translation in Persian. So right. um, I am, I feel ambivalent about it a little because it was primarily sort of written for a non-Iranian audience, if you will. Yeah, I understand. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, we'll see. So I might, you know, I might translate to Persian myself, but uh, yeah, there is some interest in other languages. Interesting. I think that would be a good way to reach a wider audience. Um, and in terms of the research journey, how, how was that? I know you, you'd already had your scholarly research and your uh, research as a journalist, but did you have to do new interviews, new research? I read somewhere that you in, even interviewed his personal driver. I did. So that, that must have been quite interesting. Uh, what was that like? Yeah, so, um, so the book covers... Um, a, quite a long period, as I said. Um, you know, usually, really some you know sometimes when we do like PhD dissertations, we focus on either shorter periods or we focus on like one topic. So that's true. It's different yeah. from a public audience book. So I, I'll tell you about some of the bases of my research. Um, so yeah, the, the oral history interviews, if you will, or the public sort of uh, public figure interviews are yeah. So I interviewed um, Iran. Iranians who fought for Soleimani, effectively, like, and not right. just Iranians, Iranians, uh, Afghans, Iraqis who were part of Soleimani's 
Quds Force, which was a transnational mm -hmm. sort of Shia army that included um, thousands of figures across the Middle mm -hmm. East. So I, I interviewed some of them. Um, mm -hmm. I interviewed his personal driver who had been with him um, mm -hmm. since the early 80s. And so the story of war of Iran and Iraq war, which lasted from 1980 to 1988. Mm -hmm. And it's an important part of the story. It's Soleimani's first entry to the realm of history, if yes, you will. Yes. Um, I interviewed, I also, inter so he comes from the province of Kerman, which is um, mm -hmm. where my mother happens to be from also. Ah, funny. Yeah. So I interviewed people in Kerman province um, uh, who, well, this it gets funny here because of course you can imagine if you're from Kerman and you were there when Soleimani lived, everyone claimed to have known him. Ah, so yes, just, of course. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's like. I get that. <laughs> it's, it's like uh, interviewing people from Atlanta who all were like personal friends of uh, Dr. Mat yeah so i had to be conscious in in, in sort of making of sure course. i don't you know it's like the challenge of oral history of course right mm -hmm. um and i also interviewed people on russian side who were there the meeting that Soleimani had with president of russia Vladimir putin um, in mm. moscow about how to do this year so these are some of the interesting interviews i did for the book i should also note that i relied on the fantastic work of history done on iran iraq war including history of you know, brigade histories divisional histories done by uh local historians in iran and especially mm. kerman province i'm not single i'd say that but Mirzai that i talk in the book about and it's uh it's kind of uh, it's a shame that these histories are you know they're very rarely cited ever in in sort mm. of western research whereas these are people who are doing um, but publishing primary sources, but also doing really good and solid works of history, mm. um, oral history, despite the limitations of censorship of Iran, they, they really do good work. So I'm very proud to say that the chapters of, um, you said Iranian perspective, I think one of the Iranian perspectives is that the chapters of the war of Iran and Iraq um, are based on this kind of sources that are mm. often not uh, consulted um, when then writing about these periods. Very interesting, and that's quite an insight. And I think it's also access. I think mean, that's another issue. Not many people have access to these sources. It's another reason why the book is so important. I, I have a question about the title, The Shadow Commander. It's very uh, appropriate. Um, was it something that you, uh, is that how you envision him? Some, this enigmatic, mysterious figure? To be honest, by, by, uh, by the time that I started sort of uh, writing a book, the, the title had become a commonplace almost in Western mm -hmm. media, actually, that uh, they used for him. Dexter Filkins used it in a New Yorker piece, you know, many years ago. There was a BBC mm -hmm. documentary with this name. And I thought, oh, yes, I thought yeah, and I thought it apt. I thought it apt because, um, because for many years, what's, what made Soleimani special really was this shadow character mm. so the fact that he was you know he was it looked like he was at the one you know more than one place at the same time right you know mm. uh, so he, that almost gave him a mythical sort of uh, reality right that he we would pass you know from iraq to syria to lebanon and mm. Tehran, and he would he would move across very, and he really was like a shadow but it's also at the end of the book i um i talk about how he had really come out of the shadows um, and he had become mm. a media celebrity, of course. And uh, that's right, yeah. You know, mm. and that might have actually played a role in his demise ultimately. So, you know, we yeah. all like good tragic history, uh, stories. So, <laughs> it's um, very Iranian, so, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. very, no, that's very interesting. And, um, and now that with his passing, has that crippled Iran's reach in the, in the region and its um, foreign policy? Do you um, think? Well, so definitely Soleimani is not a man that is easy to replace. His replacement, uh, Ismail Qa'ani, uh, is, um, he, you know, has a few things against him. One, he doesn't even begin to have the charisma that Soleimani had. He mm. is not, even though he has experience in the Iran-Iraq war, and in fact, you know, like Soleimani, he has that past in the, in the Iranian armed forces and the, the IRGC. Um, he, he doesn't seem to be ad, as adept. Um, and also he doesn't really speak Arabic. His specialty has actually been the East, Eastern neighbors of Iran, right? Afghanistan, Pakistan, that sort of front. Whereas now that Iran's most important alliances are in the, you know, with the, Sh with the Shia groups in the Arab world, Hezbollah in Lebanon and uh, mm -hmm. Shia forces in Iraq, and of course Assad's government in Syria. So Iran is gonna have a lot of problems, but also most importantly, perhaps more important than Soleimani's demise is the general demise of the Islamic Republic's and capabilities. It has a huge economic crisis that it's facing. Yeah. Um, 
this means that it doesn't have the same largest uh, to, to extend to its allies. And last but not least, of course, Soleimani's last months in life already had seen a mass movement in both Iraq and Lebanon, uh, which are against Iranian interference, frankly, right? And they, they oppose mm. the Iranian, they oppose Hezbollah in Lebanon and they sort of Iraqi Shia, Iran's Iraqi allies. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And uh, these movements have nowhere from subsided. If anything, they've continued and they're very major forces in the politics of both Iraq and Lebanon. So I think the Iranian uh, interference in the region in the way that had peaked uh, under Soleimani is going to face many challenges um, in the years to come. Yeah, especially with what's happening in Lebanon, the backlash against Hezbollah, I think that's very indicative of where the tide is shifting. No, thank you so much for that. And um, sort of as a final question, I'm wondering, what do you think uh, the contribution of this book is to uh, wider scholarship? Do you see it as something that's contemporary, something that has a legacy? Would you follow it up with another uh, kind of research? I know it's always so well, awful when someone <laughs> asks about your next book when you've just published a new one. <laughs> No, well, as you know, I'm uh, still doing my dissertation research, mm -hmm. and my dissertation is actually sort of a prequel to this, if you will, because it's the story mm -hmm. of Iranian Arab revolutionary links in the in the 1958 to 1979 period, um, and it's a different sort of work because I mean this is sort of for a more public audience, but um, mm -hmm. you know I'll I'll leave to the audience to see what the contributions are generally, but I can say what are, what are some of my hopes are right um, with the book. Um, so I, I have a few hopes. One is that I am a proponent of the biographical approach in the field, if mm. you will, as a whole. I think it's terrible that we don't have um, biographies, really, of most major figures. I mean, if you look at the US mm. history, there are like 10 mm. biographies for third rate generals mm. of the Revolutionary War or the Civil War. Whereas in, in Iran and in the Middle East as a whole, we don't have biographies for the most important figures. And when we do, mm -hmm. they're usually written by journalists, not by historians. So, you know, mm -hmm. of Yasser Arafat, of Saddam, of Nasser. I mean, you know, these are really, the, they're very good works done by journalists, but they're still not, you know, they don't really, are not part of the mm -hmm. scholarly that's work. And I think that's, mm -hmm. I think that's one contribution. Um, the other mm -hmm. is that I think, I think something profitable happens if you want to call it transnational history, if you want to call it, um, well, there are different names we can use, global history. Uh, but I think it's important to look at, if you want to understand the place, you need to look at what it does in other places. So I'm hoping this yeah. lens of looking at Iran's uh, actions in the region, um, mm. but also looking at the history of the region in a more broad lens through, you know, on, on more than one country, looking at relations, ties, entanglements. Um, I think that that leads to some results. So I hope what I've tried in the book um, will show that these approaches can be quite profitable when they are, mm. um, when they're applied um, to different topics. And it doesn't need to be military alliances. And the last but not least, um, uh, it is a, you know, if you will, it's a love letter to the to the Middle East and to the Iran mm. and the Arab world because I think the stories of our entanglements um, they can often be bloody mm. and you know negative in some ways, but it mm. would it should be a reminder of how intertwined our fates are, mm. and I'm hoping mm. that um, you know I'm hoping that when we speak about Iran's influence in the region, I hope that this influence and the other way around as well the Iranian Arab relations can one day be um, in history in arts in culture in progressive mm. politics um, and that the stories in this book show that uh, our fates are intertwined anyways and uh, yeah. you know we better we better not want to detangle them but uh, entangle them in, in better ways yeah, no, that's a that's a good way to put it. I can only hope for the best. But so far, the reception of the book is very good, and um, it's it's had very good traction and great reviews. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting my own copy soon. I've got a bit of, a bit of a pile of books to read, but I'll get to it very soon. So congratulations again, Arash, and thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. Thank you for doing thank this. You.